let's unify Germany. So it's just the way things worked out. You know, Wednesday is such a weird day. I decided we are going to do a little bit more, so we're going to watch the day the universe changed on Wednesday. So I'm giving you the worksheet now. And I'll post it for everybody online. We will watch it tomorrow in class, and I will record it. Sound good? Are we just doing all of it in class? Mm -hmm. We're doing class tomorrow. So we'll do that tomorrow. Let's get Germany unified, and I'll finish up any loose ends, and then we'll do the desktop project. Sound good? Yep. That's Friday. So we'll do the same thing. And I I got it basically half done. I'll put it on Teams so that everyone at home will be able to do it. There are good elements of Teams and bad elements of Teams. But at least we can still do the task. And everybody wants to do the task. Yeah. So let's go ahead then and review on that. And then tomorrow what I'll do is I'll go through, so I gave you the review list uh, already. Everyone has the review list for the test. And so there'll be a couple things, but I'm just gonna ask really basic questions. Tomorrow or Thursday, I'll give you some hints on the short I need, but it's a big unit. I told you this was gonna be a big unit. So are we stopping after Beethoven? Yeah, well, uh, we might have, in fact, we're going to have cholera and sewers and coke and anthrax. We will okay. have that. Because that will be a day the universe changed. So not pastor, surgeon, or dickens? Not pastor will be on there, too. Okay. I bit my tongue third period, and I'm not happy about it. I bit it. Right when you study all left, I'm blaming you. Study all left, and I nailed right the tip of my tongue. You did what? Oh no! How is it now? Tongue's heal fast, but I've been a lot. <laughs> I bet, and it gets sore by swollen. How how you do it? You eating something? Of all things. <laughs> wow. Was the milk that worth it? Yes. Okay, so it was all worth it. <laughs> so we have Bismarck. Oh, we got Italian. What was it called for when Italy kid Italy was unified, but they didn't get all what they wanted. What was Italy incomplete? What was that called? The name I gave you. Italia. <laughs> it start with an N. It starts with an I. Yeah, you're a Italy was not quite complete. Oh, and what great bit of food was made in Naples for Italy? Uh, we need a pizza day. Maybe if things, if things are maybe getting better. I think we're on the edge of having a better market. We got the vaccine. Well, and then. Italy didn't quite get everything they wanted. And who did Italy go to war with? Who did uh, Sardinia and Piedmont go to war with uh, that allowed them to get big hunks of northern Italy? They kind of allied themselves with France at the end of the 1750s, 1850s. Austria. Yeah, they went to Austria. And then Austria, they, they lost Venice when Austria went to war with whom? 17, 1866. Prussia. Prussia. And then who evacuated Rome and allowed them to take Rome? And who is the commander of the red shirts? Yeah. Garibaldi. And so we I told you we have a liberal empire. We got oh, we talked a little bit about Credit Mobiliere. So we're right here, aren't we? We're on step two. Yeah. Oh, okay, so we got here. And so in the weird situation that happened, yeah. So, right, Sardinia Piedmont allied with France to get north 
Italy from Austria. Mm -hmm. And then they attacked France when they were in the Papal States. Yes. That's called real politics. Okay. Just making sure I had that right. Consistency, that doesn't matter. Hypocrisy doesn't matter. All you get is real politics. You always have a, a, a very set goal to do whatever it takes to get there. So it's a very yeah, it hard like, pragmatism. Because France was a, like, a really strong country. And so, like, I mean, they're one of those people who go, okay, I don't like that. And then just, like, take them over. But France might have been occupied with something. Oh, right. So that's why they're they were able to do it. And we'll get to the big occupation right now. And that was a big event. And so with that, so what we have next, the Austro-Prussian War. And Holtz and Schleswig, these are the two areas they got from Denmark. And this was kind of Austrian domination. We got, even though they're technically independent, they're under Austria's umbrella. And Schwedels, Schleswig, no, yeah, that would be under Prussian domination. And Prussia under Ur, Prussia wormed Austria into a war. And how they did it is this. They convinced potential enemies, or northern, or I'm sorry, they convinced allies of Prussia, potential enemies of Austria, to cut off supplies in the Holstein. Basically play games with them. Basically convincing Austria that we're going to be isolated up here. Austria, panicking, realized that Prussia's gaining the upper hand. They foolishly used that as a pretext to declare war on Prussia. And Prussia is ready. Remember, Bismarck had made the military. He's organized conscription. And he's organized a system of mobilization to call out those now trained troops that we would call reserves. He called them out, stole a march on Austria, and marched into this area of Saxony and into Bavaria and all the way threatened Vienna. So they invaded Austria just shockingly fast before the Austrians were ready. And at the Battle of Konigsgratz, Prussian forces routed the Austrians. So superior army, faster marches. And this shows it right here. A new type of weapon, a breech-loading musket, so you put, that me? Yeah. This is, oh, okay, got it, thanks. Yeah. A breech-loading musket called a needle gun. That you could load, you put the bullet in here instead of down the muzzle. And it was called a needle gun because it had a little needle in the firing mechanism that would poke a hole into the cartridge and expose the gunpowder. It actually wasn't a great weapon, but they could fire anywhere from seven to 10 rounds a minute. A muzzle loader, you're lucky to get four, three or four. Three was like firing amazing. It overwhelmed the Austrians and won a huge victory. And by the way, you see the Prussians right here in their black uniform. And the helmets were mostly de uh, um, decorated with, in World one of the allies called the Pumpernickels. Uh, Pumpernickel helmets, but that's the kind of helmets they wore in World War One too. And they had the uh, decorative Prussian shield, and then they put a uh, gray canvas over to protect them. But it was not protected at all. Now you got a message uh, to go to the end of class, and you don't want to miss it. Yeah. Okay. Put your account to it. <laughs> so that, and I love this cartoon of the Prussian octopus now, who's now sweeping over Northern Europe, because basically with Prussia winning this war, the rest of Northern Germany has no choice but to put themselves under the umbrella or the tentacles of Prussia. And I love, <laughs> poor, look at the poor Austrian octopus. He looks so sad. I thought this was a pretty funny cartoon. And uh, this is from Britain. But this is implying Germany gaining more and more power going into the 20th century, where Austria is going to become more of a junior partner to Prussia's last Germany. 
And so what that would do is that would allow for the creation after the peace of Prague that ended the Austro-Prussian War, that would allow for the creation of a German, North German Confederacy under the power of Bismarck and, and King William. Are we good? Yeah. And so here is Bismarck sweeping away the weak Prussian or, or the Austrian army. It's not the Austrians were that weak. They were just taken by surprise by how fast the Prussians got ready to fight. So the Peace of Prague ended the Austro-Prussian War. Ironically, Austria would find themselves closer and closer allies to Germany or to Prussia than Germany over the next couple of years because they had no place else to go. After they were beaten, they kind of came back. In fact, this shows it pretty well. They had no choice but to come under the tentacles of Prussia slash Germany. So. So he limited the Austrian Confederation and started the German Confederation. And so that is a huge step. Now, Northern Germany is under the umbrella of Bismarck. So Bismarck, you know, step by step. And he wouldn't take long. He would immediately, too. Oh, I hope I have this down. Oh, we already said that. <laughs> I started reading before I realized that time was down, too. Bismarck, he would start making better relations with Austria. Because he wanted Austria on his side when he goes to its next big threat. This is real politic. I attack Austria, defeat him, and now we need him as friends. Why? Let me get a drink of water. All right, before we get started, Aaron, I just read your message that we want to see Boris the cat. I want to see Boris the cat. Who here wants to see Boris the cat? We got overwhelming votes. What is Boris the cat? Boris the cat, uh, Aaron has a 42 pound kit. Okay, I made that up. But, Boris! <laughs> that is great. How old is Boris? Boris is a big kitty. Thank you, Aaron. We needed to see Boris. Of course. He's 11 months old. Oh, Boris. And, what, and that is a good name, right? Boris is a great name. His sister is named Natasha after Boris and Natasha from Rocky and Bullwinkle. I love that. <laughs> Very clever. Yeah, we don't know where Natasha is right now, but Boris decided to study with me. Well, they're spies, so Boris is keeping you occupied while Natasha is involved in espionage. Probably. That's usually how cats roll. Cats are, cats are always up to something. I like cats a lot, but yeah. So, here I like a, um, here's Bismarck rounding up them into the North German Bund. The North Deutscher Bund. That's, Bund means Confederacy. And by the way, that's a Bundesrat is the German parliament now, Confederacy. But even Northern German states didn't want to join, they're all pushed in. Very Bismarckian. I don't know who that is. <laughs> So, with that, you have Northern Germany, either Prussia is now much bigger, and all the other smaller kingdoms, principality, even little republic, cities, like Bremen, it was a city state, they're all now under the Prussian umbrella. Southern Germany is still relatively independent, but Prussia has wiped out the Austrian influence. And so now, Bismarck wants something to get Bavaria and the other southern states into this confederation. And how do you do that? Well, you don't bite your tongue, and then... That's the best part of bite your tongue. How many times have you bit your tongue again since you did it? No.
So he needs another enemy. Bismarck's policy of blood and iron was basically, how do I unify? Find an enemy of an enemy to unify. So with that, the M's dispatch. And the M's dispatch would be used as an excuse to go to war with France. In 1868, there was a, a revolution in Spain. Spain wanted the Kaiser's cousin, Leopold von Hollens. Hollens. The Hohenzollern dynasty was the dynasty of Russia. And so he was a Catholic cousin. The reason I put that down is Spain has to have a Catholic monarch. Spain is a Catholic state, especially at that time. Prussia is Protestant. They want that. Now, you can imagine how countries might get better. Remember the war in the Spanish secession? And how upset Britain and Prussia and Austria got when Louis XIV wanted to put uh, his grandson on the throne. And so with that, they're like, oh, we're going to get Germany, meaning Oh, I do have a map. Right. Have I ever shown you guys this? So, uh, great map. They didn't make these anymore. These are fantastic maps. Here. And it's, but it's a little bit dangerous. Are you ready? Wow. We're not messing around here. So, France did not want Germany and a Spain with a German prince surrounding them. Hope you can hear me online. I don't know if you can see the map, but did you see the scary map? I'll have to show you when everyone's here. Oh, screen Brainwashing, we're talking cults and special topics. So with that, now France protested and Spain asked, uh, Spain withdrew their office. It, it was withdrawn. You know, Napoleon was furious. But now, here's the thing. This wasn't a big deal for Bismarck, but now we saw. Now he can rally the other German states against France by claiming they're against Germany with this whole issue about not allowing Leopold as king. Now, this is somewhat garbage. It's a logical move by, by France, even though France should have no voice in this, but still. And so, the French ambassador, though, at Ems, Ems is a resort town uh, right about here. This is the area of the Ardennes Forest. I guess it's just beautiful. They have, um, it has hot baths. They have uh, hot springs there. People go there and they sit in the sulfur water and get the cure. I've not been to it, but I guess it's just beautiful. Another bus trip, right? Who needs the cure? Who likes sitting in sulfur water? A lot of people do it, but I get a little sick. <laughs> so the French ambassador went there and he asked the Kaiser, you have to apologize for Louis Napoleon before ever asking for supporting this. So basically, France was playing a power play. France was having their own political issues and they wanted to justify their actions in Spain. There are other issues about what's happened in Mexico. So there's some clear problems with Napoleon was having at that very moment. And so they wanted Kaiser to say, we're sorry we asked for our, um, we asked for my cousin to be the king of Spain. And you can imagine what Bismarck said. They're trying to humiliate, not Prussia, not the Northern Confederacy, but humiliate the German people. So Bismarck doctored the telegram. And it's easy to doctor a telegram. You know, telegrams just are just may move, move a few words out, issue to the press, where it, it made it appear like this wasn't just asking to apologize, it was an insult. And he mocked King William. I'm 
put it down to Kaiser, and I did this without thinking. The Kaiser would be the, the emperor of Germany. He was still king at this time, but he will become Kaiser Wilhelm. Now, here's the thing. Everyone knew he doctored it, for the most part. It came out as proof a few months afterwards. But all they needed was a couple months to get people riled up. You get people riled up, and even when they find out the truth, they're still mad at France. They're like, how dare France insult us? And so they could go to the southern German states and say, see, France insults you. We must unify to get France, or they'll come after you. Yeah. I mean, it's still kind of, I guess France is being a little presumptuous. Yeah, France, I mean, this was stupid. This was stupid. And Bismarck saw his opportunity. Yeah. And he didn't have to do a lot, I don't imagine. And the French should have done that, especially after this was withdrawn. Spain withdrew that ask for the cousin, for Leopold. There is the Secretary of France, the Duke de Gramont. And Gramont bumbled and stumbled into this. He demanded the apology, uh, um, the apology, and then when it came out that it was an insult, he didn't back down. He said, well, yeah, William did show us disrespect. And so the point is, the French were being manipulated. This is one of the things when you have an emperor, and you think, well, an emperor is going to pick an emperor like Napoleon, and who's kind of a dictator, but he'll pick loyal people to ensure the empire. No, they pick people who are loyal. And loyalty does not mean you'll get smart people. Loyalty means you'll get loyal. Loyalty. To you. And the problem with picking someone just for loyalty to you, it doesn't take much for them to be loyal to somebody else. And so with that, there is the chief of the, of the Prussian general staff, Helmut von Molke. And von Molke had been... Um, so he was the one given the power by Bismarck to build this Prussian army. And then now he has soldiers from the Northern Confederacy and perhaps from the Southern German states. And he had been planning and planning this. And von Moltke in many ways uh, created modern armies. He set up a, a series of staff officers and a general staff, soon to be called the Great German General Staff, to plan and to organize to organize the reserve, but he had been planning for years for a potential war with France. So while France is bumbling and stumbling, the Prussian army that showed how fast they could organize their forces in the 20th century, this will be called mobilizing, under von Moltke. He'll be one of the greatest heroes in German military history. It'll be his nephew that will... Uh, blunder his way into World War I in 1914. So we get to step five, the Franco-Prussian War. So by getting the insult, they were able to make a formal declaration of war on France. And France was not prepared at all for this. Napoleon III, he wanted to lead the troops because his uncle did and he could do it, but he had no idea what he was doing. And France had a powerful army, but they didn't have the reserves. You know, those conscripted men that when they're out of the army, they would still train and drill. I should add, every country in Europe would soon follow this model. Then Japan would follow it. The US never really did, even though the US had T-71 and for years of the crates something called the National Guard. Well, here's the common board. So the war is gonna be here. And the problem with this is, it's pretty mountainous and rugged territory here. So France had Alchay and Lorraine right now? Alsace and Lorraine, yeah. Guess what's happening here in a minute. Oh, okay. So Alsace is here, Lorraine is here. And it's really rugged territory. And the French had built a number of forts and thought they had this pretty well fortified. But the assumption was then, the German plan, get around the forts as quickly as possible, 
and deplete the France before they could bring up their smaller reserves. So von Moltke knew I could march fast and do this. And Napoleon would be outmaneuvered. And that's exactly what happened. Napoleon tried to put his main defensive force on the line, on the border. Von Moltke broke through and surrounded. When, von Mol when Napoleon realized he's surrounded and tried to break out here at a place called Sedan, this would be one of the most decisive battles of the war, of the 19th century. And this would be also one of the most decisive uh, battle points of World War II, the Battle of Sedan. Beautiful area, rugged hill, got the uh, a massive river called the Muse River that runs right through there. And in this pretty confusing battle, here are a couple of dramatic shots of the French, and this kind of a glory shot of them rallying under uh, horrible odds, even though it was relatively close, but the Prussian superior training. And the pole, or uh, von Moki did the classic maneuver. Okay, it's hard to tell on this map, but he did a little bit of what his uh, what Napoleon, Francis Napoleon did, like an Austerlitz. Here's the French army, and he encircled them and swept them behind and cut them off from their supply line. A massive ma uh, maneuver, march, and encirclement. A huge Prussian slash German victory. Here are the last, this is a very dramatic shot of the last French soldiers holding out in Sedan, even though it wasn't quite like that. And here is Napoleon surrendering to Bismarck. Napoleon would have to surrender. It was a huge, dramatic victory. Now, French propaganda is going to play this as, first off, heroic stand so they had no choice to surrender, but fear of the evil Prussians coming, and you can guess what this is implying it's going to soon happen to France, represented by her. Implying this was a German attack. And while this is going on, and Napoleon has surrendered, the rest of France says, we're not quitting. So the fact was, here's Saddam. Prussia won. Napoleon surrendered. Napoleon would sue for peace. They come up with terms. And Germany could unify. That was Prussia's plan. No, France, French propaganda played this as, okay, the incompetent Napoleon lost and they stayed in the fight. And here is, I love the uh, Germany, there's the, uh, Bismarck swallowing it up. But here is the memorial in at the Brandenburg Gate, which is in Berlin, and talking about the memorial for the great victory in Sedan in 1870. So here's Bismarck and Napoleon meeting. Napoleon lost, super peace, but France did not quit. A provisional government was organized. And this is going to be called the government of national defense. And France is going to stay in the fight. They created a new republic. So Napoleon's gone. And here are the leaders of the new republic. And they're going to organize their forces and they will continue the fight. The problem was. Napoleon lost most of the best trained forces in France, so this is going to be disorganized militia. And so Bismarck is like, okay, you're going to stay in the fight. We got to take care of this. But we'll be the new republic that I mentioned before. This is going to be one of the symbol, and you notice once again, lady, um, she represents liberty right here. I think this is fascinating, the kind of vague women representing France, and then, but it's all being done by French guys. You can tell you everything you need to know about the kind of sexism at this time. But, so, this is Sedan right here. So what did, what did the Prussians do? In three wings, here, here, and here, they defeated the last remaining French forces and then surrounded Paris. So they're going to make the provisional government quit. But the provisional government will not quit. 
by the way, this might seem like insanity, but they also understand one thing. How will the Prussians remain supplied? This long supply line will begin to run out of supplies and maybe we can wait them out. Yeah. So, I mean, from Bismarck's perspective, the goal of the Franco-Prussian War was to unify with Southern Germany. Mm -hmm. Give, them, give then, them a common enemy to unify. And at this point, he'd already done that, right? Yeah. So basically from his, is like, he's sort of looking at the fight and saying, well, how far you want to go? I'm I did what I wanted to do. Exactly. But the problem is this new provisional government won't quit. Oh, okay. And so they won't super peace. And he knows, I just can't leave. Okay. So I've got to knock them out. And now he's getting mad. And this is going to be, in a way, kind of a glorious moment for France to stay in the fight, but also it's really going to hurt them and lead to this years of humiliation. And so this will lead to the Siege of Paris. And the Siege of Paris is going to last almost a year, where Prussians are going to surround Paris to start out the provisional government. And here are French defenses within Paris, French guns, and the problem is, as just as they found out the Crimean War, it's really hard to attack fortified positions. Your men have got to emerge from their defenses and they'll get mowed down because they're out in the open. And now with new weapons, like canister, remember I mentioned canister before, and breech-loading muskets, the casualties are outrageous. And anybody here, including the Prussians, they all knew what happened to during the American Civil War at a place called Petersburg and the horrible siege there where the Union Army couldn't drive out the Confederates even though the Confederates were literally starving. So here's the French plan. Can we hold out? How long can the Prussians hold out? It went on month after month. Here are French celebrating uh, soldiers coming into Paris to defend Paris. Here's a real picture of Paris during the fight. You can see the destruction by Prussian artillery to begin to fire into Paris. And by the way, you see that? That won't be there much longer. The horse. You besiege a city, they run out of food. And pretty soon they're reduced to eating anything and everything they could find. That's what the lines around Paris look like. The Prussians surrounded it, they built dug trenches, and the French held forts all the way around it, and the siege went on month after month after month. By the way, this is how on earth what's going to happen in Paris. Soon they were reduced to eating anything that was alive, and they'll be thinking the same thing in World War I. What about the black lines? Those are supposed to be... These are the first Prussian lines, and then the red lines are within each other as well. Soon within Paris, it became just a waiting game. Yeah? Say it again? Did they turn into like animals? Not quite. Well, maybe a little bit. So, Leon Gambetta was one of the French politicians. And he would ride, uh, try to, he was trapped in Paris too. And Gambetta would be one of the leaders of the Fourth Republic. Third Republic. Third Republic. He would take a hot air balloon and ride over the Prussian lines to try to rally the rest of France to come to the rescue of Paris. And it made a big deal. You can imagine, you know, he flew out this modern technology. And that's a really serious question that we have to deal with this, deal with to this day. Are we gonna harness the power of the balloon for good or evil? Think about it. The mighty technology of balloons. Okay, this is kind of the precursor to planes. We're not quite there yet, but please have the picture of it. Yeah, here is the balloon ride of him over the sea, um, flying out of the siege of Paris, and him supposedly going over the defenses. We're going in 1871, but pretty soon within Paris, they're literally starving to death. So here's a picture of a store in Paris, and don't tell Boris this, but they were selling cats, dogs, rats, any animals they could find because they're so out of food. So you see that rats, dogs, and cats. Which the cats and dogs make me sad, but then again, it was 1871, so they probably would not be alive today. 
I don't know. Cats are pretty amazing little animals, but they were reduced to almost or this literal starvation. At the Parrot Zoo, that would quickly become meals. Here is a menu. This is on the 99th day, and I put this up there so I can remember what's on here. But this is going to be a big dinner for the wealthy that remain in Parrot, and they're taking um, some animals from the zoo, other animals they found. So we have stuffed donkey's head, which not bad. I mean, you know, you got to cook it right. And elephant, that's kind of a, a thick broth soup. Elephant broth. Why can't they just make everything in the States? Camel. They're, they're French. This is fine eating. No. It's you not. Even. Well, you make a soup in last one. Oh, okay. Cam cam uh, camel kangaroo soup. Now, that's a, that's a perfect combination. Zoo animals? Yeah. Okay. Zoo animals, like the bear, and then cats with rats. I'm still trying to ponder this one. And a wolf paunch in beer sauce. So do you think they presented like the cats with rats, like they do the suckling pig with the emblem? I think that's what they were doing. I think it was implying you know the cats eat the rats or you eat them both. Yeah, uh, it's don't we don't think too much about it. Just kind of laugh at the how ridiculous this is. What's for dessert? Huh? Is it for, it looks like cheese. Yeah, the, the dessert is cheese. Mm. So. The French held on in 1871. But here's showing you know, a very dramatic, very nationalistic photo of the French near the end. And finally, they would be forced to surrender. Here are the, so the French surrendered. Here's the Prussian review into Paris. And they did this massive victory march of the Prussian army to the Prussian artillery. A huge, I, I'm interchanging Prussian and German here. It was the Prussian command, but there's a lot. You know, over half the army are from this northern and southern German confederacies. But the Prussian army was the meat of the army. By the way, they'll keep the same organization in World War I. The German army was actually made up of like, the Prussian army and the Bavarian army and the Baden-Baden um, army, etc. And the Treaty of Paris of 1871, the Second French Empire gone. I didn't mean to put Third French Empire. That's a typo. Don't get mad at me. The Treaty of Paris or Treaty of Frankfurt? This is the Treaty of Frankfurt. Okay. I know. But this time, the Germans weren't going to allow the treaty in their town. They're going to allow it in German town. It's the, it's the Third French. And let's get right there. So I'll finish up any of these last loose ends because we just got a couple minutes. This is a big treaty. And the French are still upset about this. So tomorrow, the day of the universe changed seven. So I will put it up in an assignment online for everyone at home. Uh, for those of you who got it here today, you can uh, fill it in on paper and I'll collect it on Thursday. Sound good? Yes, we got to watch the day of the universe change because I watch it a lot. We love it. They're good. They are. They're really good. Yes. So, weren't there places in Africa, like Namibia, that the Golan can't come to mind that was the German colony? Uh, yeah. right a map. Not Angola. Angola was the Portuguese, but Namibia, which is Southwest Africa, and it would be in this era, in fact, right after this, that Germany would get it, and then Tanganyika. Okay. Which is Tanzania today. Okay. And then also. I knew there was one. Um, Cameroon and Togo. That fact, they, they, they called it the Cameroons. Okay. I was wondering, like, when, like, they got that and how that fit in. So we're coming to it. We'll do this in the next unit because we, we're going to do imperialism in the next unit. And that one is going to be called the Congress of Berlin. And, so did they take them over themselves, or did they get them from somewhere? They basically conquered them themselves. Okay. But what they did is they made deals with local princes and, and uh, little kingdoms there, and turned them into protectors and into swans. 
But it wasn't it wasn't like buying them from France or no. something like that. I mean, there was elements of France agreed. Okay, we won't take this part of the Cameroon and that will go to Ecuador, Africa, which is today the Congo. All right, then we'll see you tomorrow. Remember, day universe change.